Bible here somewhere. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> oh, man, it's a blessing to be here. We appreciate so much. This is a good crowd. I was telling someone before the service, I says, this is probably the best attended church I've been in in a long time. Now, that's kind of sad to say that because you have to say that because just people are just staying out, it seems like. And the pastors are always apologizing for the crowd. And I said, don't ever apologize for the crowd. I learned years ago, you, get, you, get a, you bless those who are there and those who aren't there, they just missed it. It's too bad, you know. And so we, we don't back off. We just keep on going. On the table outside, if there's any left, I don't know. I, I, people have been coming and going, but we've got a, a little flyer there on the table there. talks about help ministries. Um, I, I think I have a few more in the, in the van. I can get some more. Tonight, if you don't have, if you need some more, but tell us about what Help Ministries is, what we do. We work with national pastors. For those who weren't here for Sunday school, haven't been here before, um, we work with national pastors around the world in seventy countries, about six hundred of them, and help them to raise a little support to go back to their countries and train national leadership and start independent Baptist churches uh, in their countries. And they're doing a wonderful job. They're just they're getting the job done. It's really amazing. And even during COVID, they've, they've all been lockdowns and all kinds of stuff going around around the world, even worse than here. And uh, But they, they just continue going. I'm getting reports. I've seen pictures of baptisms and churches being established and, and uh, people um, being trained for the ministry. And so things are just moving forward. Uh, you, you know, you can't stop the work of God, no matter what you do. And the church has been in far worse situations than we are in today. The trouble is we don't, we don't have much history knowledge. If you go back to the turn of the century or even back to the 1800s in England, they, the church was in such persecution, it was unbelievable. They were burning people at the stake, confiscating their properties, all kinds of things just because they were Baptist, just because they believed that once you get saved, you ought to get baptized after you get saved, not as a baby. And that caused a whole lot of problems, um, and uh, they went through some deep, deep waters. And I, I compare some of the stuff they went through to what we're going through, and I said, this is a piece of cake, man. This is nothing. But we need to just remember that uh, God is on the throne. He's in control, and we don't worry. We don't sit around fretting. We're not, uh, the Bible says, God gives us peace in the midst of the storm. And if, you're, if your eyes are on Jesus instead of uh, the television, and the news reports that are, are geared to scare the death out of you. Uh, keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and everything will be fine. Amen. It really will. And uh, I, I tell you. And then there's a little uh, a prayer card from Brother Gomez who's going to be here tonight. I want to encourage you to come back tonight. How many will try to come back tonight? I'm going to put you on the spot here. Amen. You try, preacher. You give a good shot. Okay. Good college try there. Amen. And uh, you've got to hear this guy preach. He's a powerful preacher. And I'll say that because he's not sitting here today, okay? Uh, but he really is. I've heard him preach many times, and you, your heart will be just stirred and blessed as he talks about what's going on in Mexico now. The only thing we know about Mexico is they're building a wall, right? <laughs> but for this guy, I think Trump put a, a door in the wall for the Gomez family. They can come and go as they want to, just about, you know. Uh, but he was born in Texas, so he can come out most any time he wants. And... Um, but he's traveling with us for a month, and he'll be going back the, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So we appreciate your prayers for us as we travel around. Also, there's um, a, a, a thing for uh, a quarter holder. You fill this with quarters and bring it back in. It's $5. And all the money that comes in these will go to Bibles, and the money is sent to Help Ministries for the Bible Fund. And all that money goes right to all around the world giving Bibles to people that need them. That's a great part of the ministry of missions. And I thank God for this church that you are involved in missions giving. And um, just keep on giving. Don't stop giving because uh, there's uh, we're scared out there. Uh, the work of God goes on. God will still make sure you, you have your needs met. If you take care of God, God will take care of you. I can, I can talk all day about that, and your preacher could too, as we've experienced that through our lives. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 13, if you would. Acts chapter 13, in verses 1 through 3. We're just going to read three verses, and I'll just give you, uh, we'll confine ourselves to this passage of Scripture pretty much. 
But we want to ask the question and answer the question from this passage of Scripture. How does God use the church to reach the world? Now that is God's plan. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. It's Jesus' church, and he will build his church. I try to encourage pastors I see a lot who are, have struggling congregations, you know, and, and they, they say, oh, man, I just can't get the, you know. I said, let, let me remind you of something. Jesus said, I will build my church. He didn't say he'd build your church. He didn't say you would build his church. Amen? I mean, God's in control. If we're faithful, giving the word of God out and doing the things we're supposed to do and witnessing and giving out tracts and, and doing everything we're supposed to do, God will take care of the rest. He'll, he'll take care of the needs. And I'll tell you what, he's done a great thing here, and I, I thank God for that. Acts 13, 1 to 3. Uh, let's just read it together, if you would. Um, just follow along as I read it. You may struggle with some of these words here. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for this great opportunity we have here today to preach your word, to open the scriptures up, to emphasize the matter of missions in this missions conference here. And we thank you, Lord, for those who've gathered here. They wouldn't be here if they didn't want to be. And they want to be here, so may they get the message that uh, they can take home with them and put into their hearts and lives in everyday life. We pray for those who are listening by live stream, Lord, all around the world. We pray, God, that you will touch hearts there. And uh, Lord, uh, help them to take the, and apply these principles that are timeless and ageless uh, that, to their country, to their situation. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we mentioned, God built the church, and now he uses the church to reach the world. Now, if I were God, and I'm glad I'm not God, by the way, and you ought to be glad I'm not God too, amen? <laughs> There'd be some dead people around, you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, the God is so good, and he's so, he's so loving and kind, but, you know, um, if I were God, I, I would, um, I'd get more creative with the gospel preaching. I would write the gospel on every leaf of every tree in the world, in the language of the people, of course. That would be no problem. Send out a couple angels, that'd be done. I would, uh, I would write it, I would arrange the clouds in the sky to give the plan of salvation to the world so they could read it in their language, you know, from the sky, everywhere. You couldn't miss it. God chose neither to do, to do neither of those things. In fact, it's amazing what he did. He left the charge in the hands of mortal human beings, mere mortals. We people who are up one day and down the next, we have a headache, so we just check out on God sometimes, you know. And, oh, I don't have time to read the Bible. I'm too busy. And God says, I'm going to use you. And we let him down all the time, but thank God he still uses us. Amen? Aren't you glad for that? I'm glad he uses weak vessels, aren't you? You know why he uses weak vessels? So that he can empower us so that he gets all the glory for anything good that happens. He deserves all the glory. He wants all the glory. Let's look at this passage now. This church in Antioch was, a, was an interesting church. It came, I was born basically out of the church in Jerusalem as they, uh, people were scattered abroad through the persecution that was happening in Jerusalem. And they were fleeing to places in Syria like Antioch. And from there, there were some groups of people that gathered together, some of the leaders of the church, and they, they established this church as people were getting saved. Now, let's look at um, some things that are here, some things that I got about five, six things here that will help us to reach the world. Number one, we see that it says in the church that was in Antioch, certain prophets and teachers. And then it names five men that are gathered here. 
The first one's Barnabas, then Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, and uh, Saul. He chose the first and the last ones mentioned to be missionaries. But I want you to first of all see what they were involved with at the beginning. It says they were prophets and teachers. Now, Back in the early days, the, the Bible had not been completed. So there were people who, who told the future, who told the Word of God. Here's the Word of God. And um, today we don't have that. Uh, the word prophet today would mean preacher, a proclaimer of truth. We don't need anybody telling us what the future holds. And um, except they quote the Bible. Amen? <laughs> if they quote the Bible, we're okay. We're on good footing there. There are so many people out there just trying to tell us what's coming next. And, uh, you know, especially in light of, of um, what's happening around the world politically and so forth. You know, they say, oh, if this happens, then Jesus has got to come. No, he doesn't. If certain things happen you don't like, that doesn't mean Jesus has got to come. Who says we are, we are exempt from persecution? Most of the world, Christians in the world are being persecuted around the world today. China, India, all over the place. Terribly persecuted. I had a call from one of our national pastors in Nigeria, and he said, preacher, pray for us over here. He says, this is, it's getting terrible over here. He says, they, uh, the, the police are quitting their jobs, and, they're, and the mobs are taking over, and there's dead policemen in the street, and they're doing on, and pillaging and burning and doing all kinds of terrible things. And he says, but we're continuing on. We're still preaching the gospel. <laughs> I said, praise God, brother. And people are in a far off worse situations than we are today. But I want you to know that if we're going to get together, if a church is going to do the work of God, there's got to be cooperation, first of all. I want you to notice that you have prophets and you have teachers here who are teaching the Word of God and building the saints up. And there are five guys mentioned. And first of all is Barnabas. Now, he was from Cyprus. Cyprus is an uh, island in the Mediterranean Sea just off the coast of Israel there and south of Asia Minor and so forth. And so he was, uh, actually, he was a foreigner to that area. Then it's Simon called Niger. The word Niger means black. So he was Simon the black man. That's interesting, isn't it? Because we're starting to see that the, the, the church is made of a lot of different kinds of people, a lot of different backgrounds, different cultures, different colors. And that's the way it ought to be, really. We shouldn't, we shouldn't say, you can't come here because you don't look like a certain person or, you know, you, we only accept, accept certain people here. No, racism ought, ought to be dead inside the doors of the church. Amen? I mean, that's tough for the world to take care of. They, the world is always going to be racist. The unsaved people are always going to be. You can't pass enough laws to get rid of racism. Racism is a thing of the heart. It's an attitude. It's a, it's a hatred of, of the creation of God because God created everybody in all these colors. You think God doesn't like certain people because they're a certain color? He made them that way. How can he be against them, right? And we ought not to be either. Remember, and behind every face is a soul for whom Christ died. And oh, how we need to love people of every race, stripe. And this man here was a black man that was, he was one of the leaders, one of the prophets or one of the teachers there in the church. Then there's Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene is a country of North Africa between the north of Sahara Desert, north of the Sahara Desert, and south of the Mediterranean Sea. If some of you have been over in that area, some of you guys have been in the Second World War or whatever, you've traveled around a little bit. There's a part of North Africa there, and that's where this man was from. So he was from out of the country. I mean, he was a foreigner, if there ever was one. And I don't know how he ended up over there. Maybe he was doing trade and so forth. But he got saved and became part of this church, settled there, and became one of the leaders in the church. Then you have Menian, who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So this guy, we we'll just tag him. He was a political guy, okay? Herod was the, one of the kings of Israel there. Um, and this man was brought up with him. He, he was born at the same time. They went to the same schools. Maybe he had relatives who were in the political uh, scheme of things as well, and along with Herod. And these guys went to school together. So he was, uh, we'll just call him a political guy. All kinds of stripes of people here. Then you got Saul. He's a Jew. 
Well, you got Jews, you got Gentiles, you got foreigners, you got black men, you got white men, you got, um, you got North, Ameri- North African people, you got political guys, you got religious guys. I mean, and these guys are all getting along together in the same church. Can you believe that? Isn't that amazing? You see, God cannot work in a church that is divided. You've got to have cooperation. You've got to work together. Can you imagine if the sound guy back there doesn't get along with the song leader? Now, they happen to be the same guy, so that could be a real problem. You get a split personality or something, amen? But can you imagine someone, you know, well, I don't want to, the pastor says, well, let's do this. Says, I don't want to do that, preacher. Just a minute. You can't go ahead with God if you're going to, you say, well, I don't think we ought to have a Thanksgiving dinner next Sunday. Let's have it on Saturday. Just to be, just to be mean, you know. And say, I know your pastor, he'd probably say, well, brother, that's a good idea. Why don't you have it on Saturday at your house, okay? The rest of us are going to meet on Sunday. That's probably what you would do, would you? I, I know you pretty well. So go ahead, man. Have it your way. But you know what? You've got to get along with each other if you're going to serve the Lord together. You can't go ahead. You can't be divided. You've got to be of the same mind and, and united. Secondly, there's occupation. Occupation, not just cooperation, but occupation. Look at verse chapter verse two. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, they're ministering to God. They're doing what they're called to do in the church. If they're called to teach, they're teaching. If they're called to preach, they're preaching. If they're called to work with the youth, they're working with the youth. If they're called to take up the offering, which you don't have to do right now, they take up the offering. Amen. If they're running the, the soundboard, they're running the soundboard. If they're playing the piano or the organ or leading singing or taking, uh, cooking food for meals, um, uh, going out and giving out tracks and distributing door hangers and stuff. Listen, everybody's got a job they can do. And everybody, you know, you're happiest when you're busy. You, I'll tell you, the crabs in the church are people who don't do a thing for God. They just sit around and they look at everything that's not being done the way they think it ought to be. Pastor, why don't you, we, we need somebody to do that. You need to get somebody to do that. When I was a pastor, I said, that is a great idea. Why don't you do that? Amen? Hey, if you got the idea, God must be working on your heart. He must be leading you to do this ministry. You don't hear them talk about any more ministries anymore. It's over. But they'll sit back and go, well, I don't know. Hey, by the way, some of you come from other churches. I mean, most of you, all of you probably come from different churches. It's amazing when you come from a different church, you bring all the preconceived ideas you have about how that church ought to operate into this church. You say, well, they didn't do it where I was. And that's just one thing to say. You ain't there. Amen? You're here. And he ain't him. He's him. <laughs> And the people here aren't like the people you came from. They're their own people. Amen? And so love them. And just get involved and jump in there with both feet and say, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to occupy until Jesus comes. I'm going to stay busy for God. These guys were not sitting around complaining or debating with each other. The Bible says they ministered to the Lord. And by the way, every ministry you ever do in the church is to the Lord. Don't forget that. Some people will serve the Lord as long as the pastor recognizes them from the pulpit. When he stops recognizing them from the pulpit, they're done. I'm not appreciated over there. Who are you doing it for? Are you doing it for him or for him? Are you doing it for the Lord Jesus Christ or to be seen of men? Are you doing it for a pat on the back? And we know Baptists don't pay anybody for doing anything, so you're not doing it for the money. Amen? Amen? Oh boy! Well, I was reading. I was reading in Nehemiah this morning or yesterday, and they and they had taken up offerings, right? And they took up the the, the the tithe, and the tithe was went for the priest and the Levites and stuff. And then they the Levites took the tithe of the tithe, that's ten percent of the tithe, and and they they paid the singers in the church. I mean, in the in the Old Testament. And I said, well, that's a novel idea. That ought to start paying singers more often around here. No, I'm just kidding. That's what, that's what they did with it. But uh, listen, just serve the Lord. Get, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get playing more up there than you get down here. Let me tell you. It's a blessing. Now, so thirdly, there was a consecration. First of all, there was cooperation. They got, they got along with each other. 
Then they, they were, there was occupation. They got busy serving the Lord. They had a, a job to do. Thirdly, there was consecration. In other words, consecration means there was a, separate, a separation of people that were in the leadership to do something else, to do another kind of ministry. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, by the way, it's God that does the calling. Amen? Amen. When I, God called me to preach, it wasn't my dad who called me to preach. And he was a preacher for many years. It wasn't my brothers who called me to preach. And some of them had been preaching for a few years. No, when I, the Lord called me to preach, it was he that did it in my heart. I know it for sure. And, and so I can't stop. Amen? I mean, if my dad, my dad's already passed on, he's with the Lord. So if he called me, then when he died, it's over, right? <laughs> no. So the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. <laughs> now, here's Paul and Barnabas. They are, they are uh, teaching the word of God. They're preaching the word of God. They're busy serving the Lord. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, ah, you two. Oh, no, he only chose two of their five men mentioned here. He chose the first one and he chose the last one. You see, God has different things for different people to do. That's, that's uh, uniquely they qualify, they qualify for. And God knew that Barnabas and Paul would be a good group, a good, good couple working together. In fact, it was Barnabas that went after Paul and Paul was, well, he was Saul of Tarsus. That's how everybody knew him. He was the persecutor of the church. And Barnabas and people who didn't, weren't quick to take him in either. I'd tell you, it'd, be like a, um, it'd be like a Muslim terrorist getting saved. Which one of you would put your name on the line for that person, bring him into the church? It would be so tough, wouldn't it? Barnabas did that. Saul of Tarsus was a, a Jewish rebel rouser. <laughs> he was a Jewish terrorist. He was terrorizing the church and pulling people. And he, he just mentioned that again in this passage. Pulling people and, uh, and, and uh, taking them into court and seeing them executed and so forth. And he, he did that and did it proudly. Thought he was doing God a service the whole time. But God says, I've got a job for Saul of Tarsus to do. And he told him when he got saved, he says, listen, I'm, I'm going to send you to the nations and you're going to suffer for my sake. You who have caused suffering are now going to suffer for my sake. And he did. He suffered much for the sake of but he never stopped. But God says, I want Barnabas and Saul. Now listen, what happened to the other three guys that were there? Well, they just stayed in that church and they stayed busy about what God told them to do. Now they, they, those three had a little bit more to do. They had to cover for Barnabas and Saul now. <laughs> and these guys are good leaders, good teachers, good preachers. Now they had to they expand their ministry a little bit more. You know, I, I'm glad there's, when you send missionaries, I'm glad people that stay home, aren't you? You know, if God hasn't called you to be a missionary, don't go anywhere. If he has, he'll let you know that. He has 101 ways of showing you that. But if he hasn't, then if God hasn't sent you out, then you stay faithful here, sending them out, keeping them financed, giving to them, praying for them, meeting their needs. I, I appreciate what the pastor said about that national pastor in the Philippines who needed tracks. And you folks raised the money and sent them thousands and thousands of tracks. You know, you're going to have a part in the salvation of many people who receive those and read those and trust Jesus Christ to save them. So when we get to heaven, it's not going to be, oh, here's the great Apostle Paul. Look what he did. No, here's the Apostle Paul and here's all the people that supported him and helped him. And there were a bunch of them. I was reading through the, the, um, the, the um, Pauline epistles, that's epistles in the Word of God that Paul wrote. And I counted, a, I counted 125 names of people that supported the Apostle Paul. He mentioned by name. It's amazing. He couldn't do the work of God without them. They provided for him. They took up offerings for him. They gave him things. They gave him coats. They gave him parchments. They gave him books to read. They, they, uh, they provided places for him to stay overnight. They, they, you know, and, they, and fed him and helped him and gave him um, traveling funds. And they just did so much for the Apostle Paul. But it takes more than just one person to do the job. You know, even the military. I'm not a military guy, but I, I talked to a lot of military guys. 
And I don't know what the ratio is, but you got guys on the front lines and there's a whole bunch of support people behind them, aren't they? They're bringing food in, they're bringing medicine in, they're bringing all kinds of, you know, uh, armaments and so forth and keeping supplied because the guys in the front can't do a thing if they don't have the support behind them. Gasoline, all the rest of it. And the same thing is true in the work of missions. They, 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 the missionaries are sent out, but they need a support group at home to keep them going. And if we drop the ball, they, they can't do what they are going to do. You know, God does the calling. We do the answering. Amen? <laughs> we, we've just got to say, okay, Lord, here I am. And, and Paul and Barnabas did that. They answered. They, but there's got to be a, there's a, a separation, a consecration unto the work of God for a special work that they do. And then in the last part of uh, verse 2, we see a preparation for this going. A preparation. It says, they ministered to the Lord, and he said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, so they fasted and prayed, and they, they prepared themselves as a church, and um, as the, these leaders did the same thing, these leaders fasted, they prayed, and the whole church is involved here, and they're going to send them out as missionaries, the first missionaries of the New Testament age, uh, out of their church as missionaries. And they're serious about this. They're fasting and they're praying and they're involved, uh, and they're, but they're preparing themselves. We have to prepare ourselves. We're going to send out missionaries. Amen. You'd like to take on missionaries. And I, I know how mo most pastors do it, you know. If they, if they want to take on a new missionary, they say, now we've got so much coming in for missions, we need this much more for missions. And, uh, and people respond to that. And they, you know, a lot of times after a missions conference, I'll get a call from a pastor. They say, well, well last year we gave this for missions, and now we're, the people are promising this much for missions more. And I say, praise the Lord. He says, so we're going to take on a few more missionaries now because we can do it. Because we prepared ourselves to do it. And so we need to continue to prepare ourselves, prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. Number five, there's delegation. Delegation, notice this. And when they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they laid their hands on them. Now we don't do a lot of laying out of hands. So sometimes we figure that, that belongs to the uh, his, to the. Um, Charismatics, you know, and all the people laying on of hands and all kinds of stuff. But when a person comes forward and, and they feel, like, I, I believe, believe God's called me to the ministry and they're ordained into the gospel ministry, a lot of times they, they, they'll examine the, 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 the candidate. And when the church says this person uh, is ordained, we believe this is a man of God, they believe that God's call is upon their life, then the men, men of the church and other pastors will come, they'll place their hands on the head of that person as they kneel in the front. And they'll, they'll, they'll ordain that person and give their blessing on it. Now, there's a couple, three different things, I think, that comes with the laying out of hands. Why do we, would we do that? And I think it's okay to do that with, with missionaries. I've, I've seen churches do that. They'll, they'll say, oh, let's have all the missionaries come up here. They all stand up front. And all the people come and gather around. The men gather around, put their hands on them, and, and someone prays for them. And what, why do they do that? Does that, does that make them more spiritual? No. Well, first of all, it's to consecrate them to the work. We're consecrating you to the work that God has called you to, and we recognize that the work that you're doing is of God. And we are saying, go, go do it. Praise God. We are with you. We are behind you. I think also laying out of hands is a recognition of the call. We recognize that God has called you to this work. And we want to stand behind you. And that's also, it's an approval. It's an approval of the church. We approve of what you're doing. Our hand is with you in this, in this work. We're going, to, we're going to stand behind you. And I think that's important. And, and, and so they did that. Um, and they stood behind them in support for their travel, for their food, for their lodging. And they had a lot of expenses. Anybody that travels know that you have expenses. The Bible talks about a person that has want as he that traveleth. <laughs> there's, something, there's something about that, isn't there, huh? If you travel, you got gas, food, lodging. It gets costly after a while. And before you go on vacation, you plan, don't you? You say, do we have all the money that we need? 
Do we have everything we need? Do we, is the car in good running order? Is we, do we change the oil lately? We don't, and all these things, you prepare for that trip. Well, when we send our missionaries out, we prepare for that as well. Think of the people in the New Testament that helped the Apostle Paul and other missionaries. The church at Philippi, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 to 18, the Bible says they sent many times to meet his need. Time and again they sent. When other churches didn't send him anything, the, Philippi, the church of Philippi sent him time and again. And there was something about that, that church of Philippi, two things. Number one, they were under persecution. And number two, they were under poverty. They really didn't have a lot. But what they, they took of what they had and they forced it upon him. Paul said one time, he says, I don't, I don't need, you, you know, you, you guys need it worse than I do. But they forced him to take it. <laughs> that's, that's real love, isn't it? And you know, people who really can't afford to do it, uh, do it anyhow. Uh, in Philemon, chapter, verse 22, Philemon's only one book, or one chapter in the, in, the, in the book there. But Philemon, Paul says to Philemon, he said, I want you to prepare a lodging for me. I'm traveling through. Prepare a place for me to stay. I'm not sure how long I'm staying. That was, that was interesting keeping the Apostle Paul, let me tell you. When he came to your church, you never know how long he's going to stay. He, just, he said, I'm going to stay for maybe three months. Um, I'm going to stay until the weather breaks. <laughs> you know, you know uh, the Apostle, and boy, they were glad to have him. But they, they took him and they kept him up there. In 3 John, verse 5 to 7, he meet, talks about a guy named Gaius, who met the needs of the brethren who came through. Traveling preachers. Paul wasn't the only one. There were other. John was a traveling preacher. Went around encouraging the churches of the early age there. And he helped them. And this Gaius, he kept them as they came through. And you know, it's a, called, we call them today prophet's chambers. What's a prophet's chamber? Well, a prophet's chamber is a place where you have it on this, usually on this property or maybe someone's home that provides it. It's a, it's a bedroom with a bathroom there and and a missionary is coming through, you just put him up there, and that saves a lot of money on, um, on motels, let me tell you. And I, I've been wanting to do this, but I haven't done it, but I wanted, to, I wanted to find all the prophets' chambers on the East Coast as I go up and down, you know, and make a list, and then I just call them up and say, all the way up there, I just stay. <laughs> but I know a lot of people, and it's a blessing that many of them say, come, stay as long as you want, and that's a real, real blessing. In, in the churches of Macedonia, uh, they, gave, they gave out of their poverty, the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 4, they gave out of their poverty. And so churches in the early age didn't have a lot, but they, what they had, they gave to the work of missions, the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ could go forth to the regions beyond that nobody had gone to before. That's the job of the church. The job of this church is to do two things. To reach people locally, that's what this is all about. And then to reach people globally. Locally, globally. We can't reach people globally personally, so we send people in our place to do it. Amen? That's your missionaries. They represent this church all around the world. And when you take care of missionaries from different countries of the world, this church, not very not, very, very not a big church, this church can have a worldwide impact. Think about that. You can be involved in, in, some, in some countries that Americans can't go to that would not be safe going to. Thank God that you had that, that great opportunity and you're doing it. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, the last thing, if we're going to reach the world, you've got to have cooperation. Let's get everybody together. You have occupation, stay busy. Consecration, separate the people that are going to be the missionaries. Uh, prepare them through your prayers, fasting, and so forth. And then we need to delegate. We lay our hands on them. We say, we are with you on this. And then the last thing is separation. And it says in the last part of verse 3, and they sent, they sent them away. What good is it if you do all that preparation and they stay in the church? <laughs> they don't go. No. You got them already. They had the call of God. The Holy Spirit called them. Everybody says, we believe your hand, God's hand is upon you. We see that in you. We put our hands to that work. We're going to support you. We're going to take care of you. And they sent them away, and they went away. And they don't come back until chapter, chapter, at the end of chapter 14. 
And when they come back at the end of chapter 14, they, they did something. They rehearsed all that God had done with them. They rehearsed all that God, that's, that's the reports that you get from missionaries when they come back. Here's what God did with us. Not necessarily what they did for God, but what God did with them. Now I ask you a question. What does God want to do with you? So I have no clue. I don't know. I didn't even know God wanted to do something with me. Oh yeah. He, if you're saved, he left you here to do something for him. If he didn't want you to do something for him, the moment you got saved, he just raptured you off the earth and you'd be gone. If he saved us just to go to heaven, that's what would happen. Amen? But he didn't. He left us behind. So he says, there's people just like you that need to hear the gospel like you did. Will you have a part in that? Will you open up your hearts to the Lord? Will you open up your pocketbooks to the Lord and say, God, what do you want to give through me this next year, every month, into the missions budget? You have a missions budget. You know, you're very clear about money that comes in here and goes out and so forth. That's wonderful. And say, Lord, what do you want to give through me? Holy Spirit, you, you told those guys to go. You can tell me what to do as well. I'm listening. And it's different for everybody, but Lord, what do you want me to do? And I'll tell you, if you ask God that question, he will answer it. He will. And then you, the blessings are going to start coming your way like never before, let me tell you. Because when you give to God, God takes care of you. And I, I could spend another hour just telling you what God's done in my wife's and my life. When we have started giving to missions years and years ago, we started out our whole marriage doing this. We give our tithe, we give our missions money. And the tithe, by the way, keeps the church going. Missions keeps the missionaries going. If you don't have a church, you don't have a missions program. Amen? So the first thing is your 10% belongs in the offering. That's what keeps this church alive. It keeps it going. And then beyond that, when God touches your heart, you give to missions on top of that. And uh, someone said this, tithe is the mission is the money you owe. Missions is the money you sow. Amen? You sow it. And it's a wonderful thing to be a, a partner with the Lord in the work of world evangelism. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we pray that you will speak to hearts even this morning. Maybe someone's heard this message and they've been convicted that they're not even saved. They say, I have no, no desire to be a missionary, no desire to give to missions, no desire to even pray for them. And now all I care about is my, my own life. That's all I care about is me. And I, I can't get my mind on anybody else because I'm the most important person in my life. Lord, and, and maybe they've never trusted you to save them. I pray, God, that this will be the day of their salvation, that they will just cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. But I believe that one sweet day you died on the cross for me, Lord, and shed your precious blood that I could have eternal life. And then you rose again from the dead to prove that you had power over death, hell, and the grave. And Lord Jesus, you said, if I would just ask you to save me and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I would be saved. And Lord, I want to do that right now. Father, if there's someone praying that even now, I pray that they'll just finish it by saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Give me new life. I trust in you and you alone for my salvation. Oh, Father, and then bless we who are saved. May we not be paralyzed by fear in this world that we live in and say, oh, I can't, I can't give to God because this might happen and that might. I've got to, I've got to have it. Lord, help us just to trust you for what's going to come down the, down the way. And, and Lord, that you would just get the glory and the praise through us and that we can see you doing mighty, mighty works through us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.